mixing desk of LARP. So as I said, this is the main tool that we use in uh, the summer school. Uh, it's a way of understanding what the design choices are when you design, uh, what possibilities you can and use, and sometimes some of these choices are locked for you because of the location you're at or the time frame and so on. I'll get into a little bit more about that. So, but before we start with the tool to design, I'm going to talk a little bit about what design is. So when you played the family Anderson, you of course had a character, which is one aspect of the design. Uh, you played this family. Then there was the fiction of being this place. You need to look at the inheritance. Um, you use some tools to be able to na navigate that. One of them was, of course, the time frame of the thing, which you, it was set to around one hour. And you step into the magic circle, as Jock uh, talked a little bit about the magic circle, that this is where the rules are different from your everyday life. And that turns into a LARP. This is not a definition of LARP. This is just describing some of the aspects. And all of these you can design by using or looking at the different parts of the mixing disk. And the big problem with the lab design is that everything is designable. So everything from the room you're in to the people that are participating, what are they wearing, what are their characters, what's the story, what's the theme, everything can be designed. So uh, a question that I often hear is to where to begin. And of course, since many of you have played very little up and maybe not designed one, uh, what questions are good to ask. And this is what the mixing disc will help you with. What questions are there to ask and what are the consequences of making decisions? So not only do you need to understand the questions that you can ask, but you should also understand what options do I have with the specific lab that you want to make. And that again depends on time frame, who are the people you're working with, and there's so many options and possibilities. And of course, when you make decisions, as I said, there are consequences. And I think that's sort of a, my main thing with lab design is that everything is a designable surface. You can design every little aspect, physical or abstract. And all of those decisions have consequences that will force you to make, ask new questions and get you to understand more of the options that you have, and then you get new consequences. And this continues until you run out of time, and the participants are coming, and then you have to run the lab that you have designed for. And of course, and this happens to all of us, and this happens every time I do a lab, is that you get smarter and more knowledgeable of what you can do. So when you start a lab and make decisions, when you get closer to the day when you need to run the lab, you have learned a lot of new stuff, then you start questioning your first decisions. But at some point, you have to let go and say, this is the way it's going to be this time. Next time, I'm going to change these things. Does that make sense? Cool. So the mixing desk. What is a mixing desk? This is the typical mixing desk you use in a studio when you make music, for example. There's different faders that are connected to a different inputs. It could be instruments. It could be singing. Uh, and then you can adjust the way that they sound and work. How much volume do you have? Uh, what is present in the song as of right now? And this is a very good way of sort of seeing the different aspects of design that you can step into when you design LARPs. And that's where we've come up with the mixing desk. And it looks something like this. Of course, you can read the text. I'm going to go through all of these different faders and what uh, later in the week, we'll go through all of them in more detail and talk about what are the consequences if you move the fader to one end or if you move it to another end. So the mixing disk is a help to make conscious choices about your design. It will help you to ask those important questions. And it's also a set of ideas to explore. So you can read about one of the faders, and then you'll understand that feel of lab design. And then you can dive deeper into and start asking more questions and trying stuff out. And also, it's a tool to teach lab design. And that's how we're using it here. Uh, and that's the main reason why it has been created, of course. But there's a lot of stuff that the mixing disk is not, and, and this is equally important as what it is. And it's, of course, that 
It's not a complete model of lab design. As Martin told in the beginning, this we are not teaching one specific true way of doing lab design. This is one way, and this is one way of looking at how to design, and there are many other ways and traditions. Uh, and they are equally right. We prefer this one for teaching purposes, but in other circumstances, we might be using a different way of explaining how to look into design. Okay? Uh, and it's not translatable into numbers. So if we go into the slider, you can say, oh, this is all the way to 10, or this is on the 7, or this is a 2. That makes no sense whatsoever, because the, the faders are sort of a little bit abstract. So when you start to push it to one end, it might go and make no sense whatsoever, because it becomes impossible to do in real life if you sort of continue the th thought pr process of pushing one of the faders further and further out to the max. So the faders in itself, I'll just explain a little bit about how they work. So each of them covers a specific design choice. Um, each end is an ideal. As I said, when we push it all the way to the end, sometimes they stop making sense. Um, but it's a good way to sort of understand what happens if you move it back and forth. So it's more about what happens when you move it than where it is on the scale. And the tricky thing is that one does not exclude the other. So not only if you move one fader, it does not necessarily affect the other faders, but also you could in the same lab have elements of a fader that's all the way in one end uh, and all the way to the other end at the same time. This, you, you shouldn't focus too much on that, but just focus on the difference between what you do if you change it more than what is the total aspect of it. We'll get back to that later in the week. So when the fader is at the maximum end, this means that, of course, the top end of the fader is the dominant one. And min is, of course, that the bottom one is the dominant one. And it's important that you don't see that the top one is the important one or the right one. Uh, e equal, the, the two ends are equally important and equally applicable. It depends on what you are trying to achieve. And of course, if you're in the middle, then both faders are present. We have uh, 12 faders that's on the curriculum that we're teaching. There are more, and uh, some have been changed from the first year, and we continue to change the wording uh, and the description of the different faders because we uh, who teach here uh, continue, continuously learn new stuff and we continuously debate the wording and how this works. So, every th so things change from year to year. They are sort of the same, but there's minute little word changes that we debate for hours and hours in the middle of the night and screaming at each other because we love that shit. So that happens. Uh, I will go through the 12 faders quickly. Don't be scared that you, you're not going to remember it all, because you are definitely not. Uh, we'll go through all of them in detail. I'm going to do one after this talk, and then Magna is going to do another one, and we'll have more tomorrow and the following days. Uh, and we'll hopefully use examples from games you have played, or been into, or labs that you have played or be introduced to. Uh, so you'll have a clearer understanding what has happened in the labs you've been playing and how the faders connect to those labs. So the first one which I'm going to talk right after this talk is uh, player communication. How do you communicate with the other participants? Are you very verbal or are you using your body language more? I'll talk more in detail right after this. Uh, player motivation. What in the lab m motivates or can motivate the players. So this is the one Magna is going to talk about later. So I'm not only going to t say that in one end, it's about it could be about winning, and in the other end, it's about exploring, for example, your emotions or a theme and so on. So it's not about reaching a specific goal necessarily, but it's about how you experience the thing. Then there is the openness fader. That is when you inform your participants, and Jörg talked a little bit about this, that you can decide to keep a lot of secrets, but with secrets also comes that you surprise your players, and that could be a problem. It could also be that you have 
all the game material available for all to read, which will create a big, a, a large amount of transparency in the game. Uh, you could also overflow people with information fatigue, of course, if you give them hundreds and hundreds of pages of text. Then there's the environment. How does the environment in the lab works? So in one end, we have what we call the 360 illusion, which when you turn the fader all the way to max, it's when everything is as you see it in the world. So if we wanted to play a lab here with the fader uh, of environment up against the 360 illusion, we would be at Ruta at the summer school, and then we would play the lab. And in the other end, we have what is called material independence. And for example, when you played the family Anderson, it doesn't really matter what the physical surroundings are. You can play it here, you can play it in school class, or you can play it in an actual house. But that's then you sort of drag the fader down to being independent from the physicality and the physics, uh, the physicality around you. So, character as mask. This has something to do with the bleed that Jok also talked about. So when you play your character, are you differentiated from your character? Are you playing somebody completely different? Or are you playing very thin characters so you're playing close to yourself? That's where you can adjust the fader. And both of them has great application. Runtime direction. So it goes from active to passive. So uh, in the active end, when you run the family Anderson, you have the possibility as uh, the, the game master of the game, of the LARP, to uh, affect the game if you want to. The game you're going to play later today, the new Voices in Art, uh, has very, a very passive style, so you only start the game and then it runs, and then at some point you end the game. You don't affect the thing while it's running. Does that make sense? Mechanics. Mechanics is all the stuff that we do to, uh, that we can't do in the real world. Jörg talked about like, if you can't fly, then maybe you need a game mechanic or a mechanic in the lab to, uh, to uh, represent that. Or if we are fighting with swords, we don't use real swords because they kill you. Uh, so there's ways of doing that. And then the application of them goes uh, from intrusive. So for example, if I am the person running the game, I go in and then I stop the game, give information that can be very intrusive. Or uh, if you are in the discrete end of the thing, you maybe you change the lighting a little bit and that means something. But it's that is very discrete. Does that make sense? Cool. Then there's loyalty to world. And it goes from playability to plausibility. For example, if we are running a LARP set during the First World War, uh, it wouldn't be very plausible to have a lot of female soldiers, for example. But you want to make the lab playable for everybody, so you change the thing in your lab so there's an equal chance of male or female soldiers. So it goes from that, that it, turns, it becomes more playable for all genders than if you are st strictly sticking to what happened during the First World War. Then there's the culture creation responsibility. Uh, if you take, for example, the lab that Christopher talked about, Delirium, there was a lot of workshopping where the participants together created how the culture within this insane asylum worked. Of course, they were coached by the organizers, but it was up to the participants to make the stuff up. Or you can, as an organizer, make sure that every little aspect is something you design and give the information to the participants. Character creation responsibility is the same. This is just focusing on your characters. Again, at Delirium, the participants themselves created their characters together, and the uh, organizers have had very little to do with that process. You can, of course, also write long and complicated uh, characters, and you'll have a very different lab uh, with a very different outcome. Both of them very strong tools, and, and it is up to you to decide in which end of the scale it will be, of course, like all the other faders. Then there's the representation of theme, and this is one of the more hairy ones. I'm going to talk about that later in the week. It is about your lab has a theme that is not necessarily the story of the thing or uh, the world of the thing, but it's about what it is that you are actually 
discussing with your participants and yourself by making this LARP. And in one end, you have stories, so you process the theme of the thing by your narrative and your story in the LARP. Or in the other end, it's about action. So the way that you design the thing, how you move around, and what consequences have by doing physical movement within the thing changes what, how you represent the theme. This is a little bit uh, hairy, as I said. I'm going to talk way more about it later in the week. And uh, the 12th uh, fader is pressure on players. Uh, how much do you push your players, for example, again, with the safety? Do you make sure everybody ha get enough sleep or get enough to drink and so on? Or if there's a, is it a very physical game where you're actually slapping each other in the face or are you just simulating it? So in the other end where you pretend that you slap somebody in the face, all the way to the other end of the fader, you actually slap somebody really hard. And both types of games have been made and there are uh, different outcomes of that, of course. Uh, and we have a lot of great knowledge about what happens if you, for example, push the, the hardcore part of the, the fader or the very physical part of the fader to the max. It has very quickly very grave consequences for your participants. And the 13 fader is, of course, the one you make up yourself. You might have a LARP that has a very specific thing that you want to do, and then it's a good idea to sort of look into would, that, would there be a specific fader that fits this thing uh, for you. So you can, of course, invent faders as you go along. These are not uh, all of the faders I said in the beginning, but it is, it is the ones that we have chosen to uh, teach at the summer school. So when you do design and you start moving the faders around, there are some important questions to ask, which of course is, what do you want to achieve? Why are you making this lab? What, what are you trying to tell or convey, explain to your participants? Uh, what faders are locked? And this is, there's a lot of faders that often are locked when you start designing. For example, if, if you only have four hours to, to run the game, or if you have four days, some of the faders will be locked in a specific place, depending on location. Again, do you have something that look exactly like the thing you want? Do you have an actual spaceship to do the spaceship LARP? Then the fader for is closer to 360 illusion. Or do you have to build one out of cardboard? Then it probably is being moved down. And there's nothing you can do about that. Then you also should very cr critically look into the different faders. One, what are the ones that you want to focus on? What part of the design? is the, uh, where are the important faders in your design of your lab. Not all of them are equally important. That all depends on what it is you want to achieve, the first question, of course. And again, what faders are missing. Don't take, don't trust that these 12 are whatever you're going to need, because each lab is different, and each one will have different goals and different opportunities, and that you need to critically examine if you have everything covered or if there's something you need to invent and design yourself. That is the mixing desk. Uh, and we'll go straight into the first fader. It is one of the quicker ones. Uh, and then Marna will take the next one, which is not as fast as the first one I have. So communication style, that's the first fader we're going to look into. And it goes from verbal to physical. So if you design labs where the fader is up against it, its max, it's a very verbal game. And if it's physical, then you have a lot of physicality in the game. So at the max, you, of course, have very clear communication. Because when we talk to each other, and we've been doing this since we were kids, uh, we are very good at looking at each other's faces and understanding what we're saying. And this gives us a very clear idea what is being communicated. And this, of course, a uh, consequence of that is that there's very few misunderstandings of what you're actually trying to tell. Uh, a big minus, if you push it all the way to the max, is that, of course, you are not moving around. You're not using the full capabilities of your body's body and all your senses. And this restricts you in many ways. Um, 
And again, if you're just talking and you are here in your head and not in your body, then you will get a limited emotional engagement in what you're doing. You will become way more engaged emotional if you are also in the body and not just only analyzing whatever you are doing. At the minimum end of the scale, which is of course physical, uh, you get a strong emotional connection if you if you hold hands with somebody or you, you are only communicating through, say, dance, you'll get a very strong connection to the world around you and to the people that you are engaging with. It's very playful. Uh, we uh, connect the thing about being in your mind and talking a lot to be not playful but being very serious while moving around and using your body, dancing or playing around or chasing each other is way more playful. Of course, it gives uh, problems with communication. It's not always clear what you're trying to uh, tell people around you if you're, for example, dancing it or moving it around, moving it, moving around, um, and there can be a quite steep learning curve in understanding the language that you are then talking in, because you're then moving away from the verbal language you're using, and then you're using a new language that you need to teach your participants, and everybody need to agree what stuff means. Does that make sense? Cool. And of course, most labs are somewhere in, in the middle, and it's how most of us communicate. Like I'm using my hands, and you use face gestures, uh, and you understand body language, because we read each other all the time, and it's a thing that we are all pretty good at, actually. And that was the first fader. Thank you.